All right, so in this video, we're gonna be talking about seven things that I've learned after working with thousands of depersonalization and derealization sufferers. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing is that they think that depersonalization and derealization are the root problem. The reason that this is, is because the symptoms are absolutely terrifying. And they're usually experiencing a lot of other symptoms. In fact, most depersonalization realization sufferers, I would say probably 70%, are also experiencing anxiety symptoms as well. But 30%, let me make sure that's right, 70, 80, 90, 100. Always just got to double check. Math is not my strong suit. Um, are not experiencing any anxiety. They're in the most deepest state of trauma, uh, which is where anxiety completely shut up, shuts off and there's just numbness and complete dissociation. But anyway, with that being said, they've got this long list of all these different symptoms, but because depersonalization and realization are the most terrifying, they assume that depersonalization and realization are the root problem and all these other symptoms whether it's anxiety symptoms or other trauma symptoms, are a symptom of depersonalization realization. And because of that, they end up focusing on the fruit instead of the root. So depersonalization realization, as scary as they are, not only are not the problem, but they are actually the solution. They are the solution to a problem that you don't have, which I'll explain in a second, but they're still technically the solution. They are trauma coping mechanisms. And whenever you hear the word trauma, you're going to think of a 20th century understanding, which is what most people have. It's what I used to have too. It's okay. It's just where we're at. But you think that trauma is a past event, but trauma is actually not an event at all. It is a state of nervous system overwhelm. And Depersonalization and realization are a way to mitigate the effects of what your brain thinks is you being eaten by a lion, right? So whenever we're confronted with um, a threat or perceived threat, the first thing that we try to do is use social engagement to calm ourselves down. <clears throat> and if that doesn't work, then we go to fight or flight response. If fight or flight response doesn't work and then we hit that overwhelm point, that's whenever we enter a trauma response. And whenever you hit that overwhelm point, typically due to a very painful history, your brain is like, okay, we need to make sure that this person's death by lion is as painless as possible. Let's make them feel detached from their body. Let's make them feel detached from the material world. And yet, even though they are technically there to help you, um, you don't know that. And all you know is you're just trying to pay your bills and take care of your kids or go to school or you know do DoorDash or whatever it is that you do, and you literally feel like you're losing your grip with reality and you feel totally detached from your body um, and everything feels fake and dreamlike. And you've usually, again, got all these other symptoms as well. And so in your mind, it just seems logical to conclude that they must be the problem. But really what's happening is you're in a threat response where there is no threat. You're experiencing either just free symptoms or fight or flight symptoms and free symptoms um, together because there's been a lot of buildup in your body due to a very painful history. There's been so much buildup in your body, so much tension, adrenaline, emotion, cortisol, fatigue, that your brain thinks that you're dying. Even though you're not, your brain thinks that you are. And so these symptoms are there to basically mitigate the effects of that pain. Because if you're being eaten by a lion and you're highly depersonalized or derealized or especially emotionally numb, you wouldn't feel the effects as much, right? So anyway, wanted to give you just a little bit of education, but depersonalization, realization sufferers don't know these things initially. I know that whenever I went through the symptoms, I did not know these things at all. And I went through the symptoms back whenever there was not nearly as much education as there is today. And I was convinced I was going nuts. I mean, I literally remember calling my dad and I was like, you know, dad, I'm going crazy. Like I'm losing my mind. And nobody could seem to explain the symptoms to me. I did finally get some education, which was actually incorrect, but basically the the book that I had read said that the symptoms were essentially representative of, of a normal part of anxiety. And um, 
technically that's not accurate, but at least I saw that and I was like, ah, I'm not going nuts. And they actually described the symptoms a little bit. And I was like, oh, thank God. But anyway, with that being said, depersonalization realization sufferers have built their whole world around these symptoms because they think that they are the root problem. And as long as you're doing that, again, you're like a dog chasing your tail. You're not really ever getting to the root as to why they're there to begin with, which is to dissociate you from overwhelm in your body and in your life. And so whenever I work with clients, that's exactly what we do is we take the focus off of the symptoms, as hard as that is, and we start to focus on what's going on in your body. What's going on in your life that is conveying that there's so much threat that your nervous system thinks that you're being eaten by a lion. And that's how we are able to help people recover from these symptoms. Um, it's a state focused approach and not a symptom focused approach. You change your state by shifting your physiology and your focus. And then we give them co-regulation as they are um, working on addressing what's happening in their body and their life. Number two, that's probably going to be the longest one, by the way. I know that that was like six minutes, but that's, I put that as number one for a reason. Number two, um, another thing that I've learned is depersonalization, realization suffers, meaning that they're, they're constantly experiencing symptoms, either 24 seven or constant episodes. They've got a very painful history and complex trauma is this understanding that the state of nervous system overwhelm doesn't happen all at once, which would be a major trauma. A major trauma is like a lightning strike. It's like, bam, just something happens that overwhelms your ability to cope. Um, but with complex trauma, you could see it as like filling up a glass of water, right? It slowly builds up and then you hit that over overwhelm point and then that's whenever depersonalization, realization kick in. So with that being said, whenever I talk to people and I start asking them about their history. They're like, okay, well, you know, I went through this thing and I went through this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing, uh, went through a breakup, went through, um, you know, a lot of anxiety over school sometimes or, uh, relationship stress. And then, you know, betrayal happens or this thing happens and then they, they get insomnia or their diets off and this thing, this thing, this thing. And whenever I talk to people, I'm like, well, no wonder you're constantly experiencing symptoms. You've had a very painful history and nobody ever taught you how to self-regulate, which is the art of staying in a calm body and keeping your body um, from being built up with tension, adrenaline, emotion, and fatigue. And so what ends up happening is because people don't know that a painful history created a bunch of sensory triggers that created a bunch of stress that ultimately built up, overflowed, they think that they're going crazy. And they start to think that the symptoms are a sign that they're losing their mind. And they usually start to identify with all kinds of labels that I won't even get into, but labels that just make them feel broken, like the symptoms are permanent, make them feel like they're going crazy. And so that's why what I say is let's not ask the question, what's wrong with you? Let's ask the question, what happened to you? Your symptoms are biologically correct for the history that you've had. And it doesn't mean that you've got a bunch of childhood trauma either. Some people have a great childhood and then later on in life, they just have, you know, kind of one bad thing happen after another, kind of when it rains, it pours type thing. Type thing. So anyway, what happened to you? Right? And once you start to ask people that question, you'll start to realize that they didn't just randomly wake up with constant depersonalization or realization. If DPDR are there constantly, either 24 seven or constant episodes, it's because your body is constantly in a trauma response. And that just is not gonna happen um, suddenly, right? So with that being said, number three, um, depersonalization, derealization, I'll add slash trauma sufferers slash complex trauma sufferers are literally some of the most resilient people on the planet. And that's what I tell people, you know, like you're going through this process, you're going through these symptoms. And right now I know it's hell on earth. I know that you would literally do anything to get the symptoms to shut off. And they're having such a terrible impact on your life. But at the same time, it actually in the end is going to lead to something called post-traumatic growth, assuming that you actually deal with the root, which is overwhelming your life and body. 
and you'll walk away more resilient than ever. Because even whenever I start working with somebody and, and we show them the things happening in their body and their life that need to be changed, um, it takes time for those things to work. And I always tell people healing these symptoms is like riding a horse. Well, first of all, you're on the ground and then you finally get up on the horse after like, you know, several weeks. And then you finally feel like everything's great. And then boom, somebody takes a baseball bat and knocks you off. And then you're back on the ground. It feels like you're at square one. Um, every time that you get back up, you're building a mental callus. You're building resilience, which is actually going to serve you in life, right? Because life is hard. Even whenever you don't have symptoms, life is extremely difficult and you need resilience. That's why David Goggins always talks about like the reason that he runs is not to run. It's because the mental callus for life that he gets from running, he says, do stuff that sucks every day because it builds that resilience for life. You got to learn how to get back up. And this is ultimately going to teach you. This is the ultimate teacher of resilience is going through complex trauma and DPDR. Okay, the next thing, DPDR sufferers live in their head all day. And I, you know, I tell people, you know, being in your head is not bad. I'm in my head all the time. I'm in my head right now and I'm thinking as I'm talking to you to do this video. But when you are never in your body because there's so much pain and you've learned to dissociate by living in your head all the time, that's a problem. Because while you're up here, you're experiencing sensory triggers that are creating tension, adrenaline, emotion, cortisol in the body and fatigue, and you're not actually dealing with those things. And so while you're up here, there's a lot of build up, build up, build up. And that's typically what ends up leading to that overwhelm point in complex trauma. So part of how we help people heal is we get them back into the body, which is called interoception, the experience of the embodied self. And it's usually pretty painful whenever you first come back in your body after you've been dissociated a long time. I tell people it's like, you know, it's like checking back into your house and it's like a hoarder's house. Um, if you've ever seen the show Hoarders on TLC, there's stuff everywhere, right? But we have to get you back in your body if we really want to deal with the root. But anyway, I tell people, you know, you living in your head all day. Well, sorry, let me say this. If you're living in your head to escape your body, that's bad. And if you're never self-regulating, coming into your body, relaxing, releasing the buildup of tension, adrenaline, and emotion, making sure that you're not overworking yourself, that's bad, right? But what I will say is, oh, oh yeah, or if you're dwelling on the past or the future, daydreaming all the time, like that's, that's where it's a problem. But if you're in your head and you're using it to challenge your mind and you're engaging your creative intellect and things like that, and then you're also listening to your body, that's the winning combination that we want. But DPDR sufferers have learned to get back to homeostasis, which is balance, through what's called somatic dissociation. As long as they are in their heads, dwelling on the past or the future, daydreaming or obsession with symptoms or health anxiety, obsession with your health or obsession over existence, or there's all kinds of other ways as well that they stay in their head. They don't have to feel what's happening in their body. And I tell people, this is actually a good thing though. You have learned a skill set of making yourself feel better. You did something to make yourself feel better. Right. So you've already got that skill set. There was at some point where you realized, hey, as long as I'm distracted in my head, I don't feel as bad. So all we need to do is simply change what you're using to make yourself feel better. And once we do that and we replace distraction, which is somatic dissociation with interoception, being embodied, safely embodied and learning how to self-regulate, now you're going to make yourself feel better in such a way that it's actually going to deal with the root issue. But you've already learned this skill set, so it's going to make a lot easier. We just got to change what you're doing. But anyway, they live in their heads because that's a way to mitigate the pain of what's happening in their body and their life. And that's why, you know, there, there are programs out there that teach people that distraction is a big part of recovery. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of deceptive because... You know, people can see results by doing that, but if you're not also changing what's happening in your body and you're just in your head all day, you're actually perpetuating the problem. 
you have to release the buildup. You're going to have to come face to face with your body at some point. And for some people, they can run into their heads or constantly distracting 24 seven. And they're so somatically dissociated. Somatic just means body. They're so disconnected from their body that maybe they can get depersonalization, realization to shut off for a little bit. And so they're just so excited. I'm cured. I don't care how it happened, but the means don't justify the ends or sorry opposite the ends don't justify the means how you got to results matters i just uh, did a video where you know this guy has been somatically dissociated for 20 years and that was how he got away from depersonalization and derealization now i'm having him get back in his body and depersonalization and realization is actually coming back but that's a good thing because now we're having him release his emotions. We're having him release the buildup of tension and adrenaline as well and make lifestyle adjustments to mitigate fatigue. So DPDR is gonna go away and now it's gonna stay away and we actually got to the root, which means that he's gonna be able to be present. He's gonna be able to be safely embodied, which is the only way that you can be present. He, he never can be present right now. So um, they always live in their heads. Um, before we get to number five, six, and seven, I did want to say we have a brand new master class. It's called the Five Shift Steal from Trauma, Anxiety, Panic Attacks, and Depersonalization Realization. There's a link in the description below. It's a 45 minute master class that I poured my entire life out into for six full months, working day and night. It adds so much value to you. Make sure to check that out. It's going to show you the five shifts that you need to make to get to the root of these symptoms, as well as at the end, there is um, an offer to work with us. Um, you can apply and we'll take a look at your situation and see if we can help. All right, number five, people that constantly suffer with DPDR, they're often very creative and deep thinkers. And that's one layer to the onion. I always say healing these symptoms, really healing trauma is like peeling an onion. There's a lot of layers to it. And it's not always the case that they're super deep thinkers and creative, but a lot of times they are. <laughs> And because they've got so much creative intellect and they're such a deep thinker, whenever they experience DPDR, they start investing all of that creative intellect, all of that deep thinking into the symptoms. And that creates a layer of stress. So imagine that this cup is overflowing. It's already overflowing. Now they're adding another layer of stress because of their obsession over the symptoms and all these creative what if scenarios, these catastrophic what if scenarios about the symptoms. So now there's even more water that's overflowing. But here's what I will say, you know, one positive thing about that, at least kind of selfishly speaking is they're usually really cool people. Like I get to work with some of the most incredible people ever, like people that are super artistic and super deep thinkers, like they're really, fun to talk to and work with um but this is one of the layers that we have to pill again going back to what i said initially you have to stop making it a part-time or full-time job obsessing over the symptoms that's not dealing with the root right if you want to get to the root of an apple tree you have to uproot the roots you can't just pick apples right so anyway um number six we're almost through this um click like if this has helped you so far a little hope goes a long way with depersonalization, realization, slash, um, slash trauma suffers. <laughs> Most of the people that come to me are hopeless. They've tried the medical system. They've tried the mental health system. They have tried usually popular programs that promised them that it was going to cure their symptoms. And going back to the resilience thing, I mean, the fact that they just keep going is just incredible to me. Um, this, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you're going through this, like you are literally one of the most resilient people ever, but they're usually hopeless. And then all of a sudden they see a recovery story or they hear my story or, you know, I just get to work with them. And then they start to see a little bit of results, um, at the beginning, even, um, even just a little break from symptoms, even just for a few seconds or a few minutes, sometimes that's all people need. But even before they get breaks from symptoms, just talking to somebody who has been through what they're going through and hearing recovery stories, you would be surprised at how much that just a little bit of hope can really, really um, change somebody's life. Because think about it, like if you've tried the best of the best stuff out there and it hasn't worked, in your mind, you feel hopeless. And so, and there's usually a lot of skepticism whenever people get on the phone with us and we have a lot of grace for that. We understand because it's like, here's yet another guy telling you, 
you know, that he's going to be able to help you. Um, and, and so I understand. Right. But with that being said, hope is very important. Um, and that's a big part of co-regulation, which is the art of making other people feel safe and calm is building that hope. And so, you know, whenever I'm coaching somebody, I, I intentionally build a lot of hope. Um, I'll say things like, Hey, you're, you know, you're going to beat this and I'll share my own story. I'll share stories of clients that I'm working with and them seeing results. And I'm telling you, people just need a little bit and it pushes them to just get back up and keep trying. Number seven, that's it. We're almost done is. This is my opinion. I feel like DPDR sufferers need to be understood before they can heal. And I think it's part of co-regulation, right? Like I can show you multiple studies that showed that co-regulation is up to 45% of healing trauma. 45, almost 50% of healing trauma is co-regulation, working with somebody that understands you, that can create hope, that can build a relationship with you, that can, that can help convey safety whenever all your brain perceives as threat. And one thing about DPDR is the symptoms are so like impossible to describe to people. You can't describe them outside of metaphoric language. And whenever you find somebody that actually can describe the symptoms to you in a way that you just know that they've been through it, that's, that's one of the number one things that I hear from people um, as to why they worked with us is they were like, I could tell you, you got it. Like I could tell you understood it um, and that you had actually been through the symptoms. It just automatically creates so much hope because you may have been looking on Reddit and forums and watching every YouTube video you can find and all these different programs or talk to your doctor or your therapist as amazing as those people are, maybe they just didn't get it. And there's something about being understood that just calms the nervous system. And so regardless of whether anybody ever works with me, I hope that through these YouTube videos and my five shifts master class as well, which is free, that, you know, if anything, you've walked away knowing that you're not alone in this and you're not going crazy, you're not losing your mind and there is hope for you, right? So with that being said, um, we spend a lot of time just, you know, me and my team just describing what we've went through um, to people because that really, really helps them feel understood, which in turn um, calms the nervous system. So that is it, my friend. I hope that that has encouraged you. Um, make sure to click like so we can help spread this video. Uh, share this, you know, encourage people with it. If you know somebody that's going through these symptoms, maybe you're a mom or a dad that's watching this for your kid. You know, maybe you can send this to them or a friend or family member or just whatever. Uh, go and send them uh, this video and um, comment something below. I'll, I'll do my best to get to all the comments that I can. And I just want to say thank you uh, for those of you who subscribe to me. It means a lot to me that you have given me this platform where I can speak. YouTube is really where it started in 2017. Had no idea this was going to turn into a career. Every single day, I still you know, have to pinch myself. Um, you know, just the fact that this is still happening five years later, I've gotten to work with every single person that you could imagine, um, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, I think like at least five or six celebrities at this point, um, you know, doctors, therapists, college kids, stay at home moms, and literally like every single title slash type of person that you could ever imagine. I have had the privilege of getting to coach them. And at this point, you know, there's really not anything that I haven't seen. Um, you know, you work with thousands of people and you, you eventually you kind of see everything there is to see. I don't really get thrown off anymore. So if whatever you're going through, if you did decide to apply to work with us, I, I can almost promise you, like, I'm 99% sure I've probably seen it and know how to help you with it. Um, but it's extremely rewarding. It's very, very, very challenging, though. Um, I have to keep myself at peak mental physical, emotional performance. And by physical, I don't mean muscle gain. Obviously, these little, that's not what I, I mean, like I have to do a lot of relaxation. I have a sauna, I have a massage chair, I have a hot tub, and I, I don't do those things for, you know, to live the life of luxury. Like I have to put a lot into my body because I carry traumatized people on my back for a living. And it, it's very, very difficult. And I've got to deal with all my own issues and my own challenges. And, you know, I'm a husband and I'm a, a father and things like that. But I will tell you, it, it, it fills me with joy 
whenever I get to see people see results and recover. And if I wasn't seeing people recover, oh my gosh, I could not do this job. There are so many other jobs that I could do. The only thing that keeps me doing this is like people saying like, you know, you're the person that got me out of this. And if I wouldn't have found you, I don't know where I would be. And I feel a sense of responsibility in that regard. Um, I don't know that I'll always do this in a full-time capacity, but I know that I will always make this a part of my life as long as I'm alive, just because um, I've just seen so many people helped. And as long as those stories keep on rolling in, um, I'm going to keep on keep on keeping on. And so thank you guys. Every comment that you guys share, um, you know, saying that I've helped you in some way, it means the absolute world to me. It really does. And it's, it's, it's really oxygen for me. And so thank you. All right, guys, that is it. Peace out. We'll talk to you real soon.